hi folks. Thank you for joining us today for the Hit Refresh at Home and Online Programming 2.0 webinar. My name is Alyssa and I'm a member of the National Culture Days team. I'm a white female in my late 20s. I have curled long brown hair and brown eyes and I'm wearing a black sleeveless top and hoop earrings. Before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm speaking to you from. The Culture Days Network is present and active in all corners of the country and collaborates with a vast array of people, organizations, and communities across First Nations, Métis, and Inuit territories. I'm speaking to you today from the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of many peoples and nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. Today, the City of Toronto remains the home and meeting place for many Indigenous people whose presence and cultures continue to shape and influence communities. We are grateful to be hosted on this land. Today's webinar structure is very simple. It's a 45 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute Q&A period. Only the presenters microphones will be on. So please type your questions in the Q&A box below. We'll be reading out as many as we can following the presentation. Today's session will also be recorded and available with captions later on if you wish to review it or share it with your colleagues and network. So today we're very excited to be joined by our friends from Arts Etobicoke Program and Gallery Manager Akshada Naik and Ian Dodds, uh, who is the Communications and Development Coordinator. Akshada and Ian will be giving us the inside scoop as to how Arts Etobicoke found ways to connect with participants that were easy, affordable, and fun. They'll be chatting more about their Arts and in Isolation initiative and will explore how digital platforms can be used to remove barriers to participation. They've also got some tips and tricks for how to adapt existing programs on a limited budget while still offering meaningful arts and culture experiences. Um, let's turn it over to Akshada and Ian and welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you so much, Alisa, and thanks uh, Culture Days for having us here today. Uh, my name is Akshita Naik, and I'm the Programs and Gallery Manager at Arts Etobico, and today I'm presenting with my colleague Ian, and I'll let him introduce himself. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, Akshita. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Dodds. I'm the Communications and Development Coordinator at Arts Etobico. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing some strategies for adapting arts programming for online audiences. Uh, we'll give you a brief overview of some of the online programs that Arts Etobico has uh, developed in response to COVID-19. Uh, talk about some key takeaways that we've learned from our experiences implementing these programs over the past year and uh, share with you some tips and tricks on how to uh, for, for running your own programs on digital platforms great um, and before we begin we would like to ask you all a few questions and uh, you can answer those by showing your hands um, by turning your videos on or by you using the raise hand button on your screen um, so the first question is, who has done an online class before? Okay, I do see something coming in chat. I have, and I'm sure all of us here have had that before. Um, so thank you so much for answering that. Our second question is, who has participated in a webinar before? Okay, who has seen a live stream performance before? Okay, that's definitely a uh, lots more than I thought it would be. So thank you so much for answering those questions and congratulations. You just did an online engagement. <laughs> our, perform our purpose to ask these questions um, was to show that online engagement doesn't have to be something scary or overly complicated. And you have probably had this experience with online programs all this while, especially in this one past year. As we jump onto sharing our experience with online programs and share our learnings and some tips and tricks, with you in a moment, I will quickly introduce Arts Etobicoke to you all. So Arts Etobicoke is one of Toronto's six local art service organizations, and we provide free accessible programming to everyone in Etobicoke. Our focus is on developing compelling and engaging programs that meet the needs of one of the most diverse communities in Toronto. We believe in providing equitable access to arts programming to everyone in West Toronto, and our programs are developed with long-term sustainability in mind, creatively engaging citizens in arts-based community development. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ian now. Thank you, Akshita. <clears throat> 
So within the first few days of the pandemic, uh, everyone was sharing health and safety resources on social media. We decided that rather than add to the noise and the panic, uh, we would take a beat to assess what we as an arts organization could contribute to help our community get through these uncertain times. We are not a health organization. We are not health experts, and we did not feel comfortable sharing health and safety information. So how can we best serve our community at this time? We asked ourselves, what are we experts at? We know how to provide innovative, meaningful, and engaging arts and culture experiences, and we are experts at celebrating our community. With that in mind, we decided to be true to our organization's goals and find out what our audiences wanted, find out what our artists needed, and how we can support them through this difficult time. We work with a wide network of artists who rely on exhibitions, art sales, performances, and teaching to earn their income. So we felt that we had a responsibility to our community to find new paid opportunities for artists. We developed a series of new and adaptive programs that we called Arts in Isolation that were centered around listening to our community and our artists to find out what they wanted to do during lockdowns. But we were also thinking about what did we want to do and what are we excited about? It can be really challenging to run an online program when you're competing with your audiences, when you're competing for your audience's attention with everything else that's going on online, uh, competing with digital fatigue or a screaming child that can't go to daycare anymore. So it's really important that your staff is actually excited and invested in what they're doing and to consider what you yourself would want to do. Sure, that's definitely difficult. Um, so as Ian mentioned, we did reach out to our artist facilitators who were very keen to learn how to use new digital platforms. So we took from their lead and asked them what they wanted to do, what they were comfortable with, and what training and support they needed. Our amazing facilitator, Sladana Zivkovic, who teaches our after-school art classes for kids, was very excited to teach online, but had no experience with Zoom. So we arranged for a few one-on-one -on -one training sessions with her to explore all the features and existing resources that were easily available. And that just made it easy for her as well as us. Our another facilitator, Morgan Verstappen, who teaches seniors art classes, had a video camera and some experience recording videos, but not familiar with video editing. And that is when we came up with a solution where she recorded clips of herself making different crafts, using materials she had readily available at home and sent them to us. Guess what? We had hidden talent very much on our team. Ian, who's right here, who figured out how to edit them. And as he was going, we were able to quickly produce weekly videos that we uploaded to our YouTube channel. This gave our seniors something fun to do while in isolation that also helped them to keep a feeling connected to their program as well as the community. We also hired a professional um, to record a video for us, a video tutorial which covered how to record videos at home by using just your phone's camera and achieving a great quality video without having to buy expensive equipments. She also showed us how to use stuff at home to create a little mobile phone stand for more stability. She shared how using good lighting options and using minimal white wall as a background could turn your home videos into an exceptional makeshift studio setup. Our in-person after-school art classes. So moving on to that, they always filled up quickly and had a long wait list. With moving our classes online, our physical space was no longer a barrier or a constraint and we could expand our class size to accommodate our growing wait list. Our class size just doubled up and there was definitely a growing need for participants, especially the younger kids as parents looking to engage their children into creative as well as productive classes while they worked from home themselves um, in a lockdown. To our surprise, these kids adapted to the online model and technology very easily and quickly. It did require for us to have some protocols in place, of course, as online features also provided them with the freedom to chat with each other. We made sure there was a moderator at all times to assist as well as support the facilitator who could then focus on the art activity and not worry much about answering each kid in the chat box. Within a few weeks, we saw these kids enjoying the online space as that was the only time they could socialize with other kids at their age. We received some amazing feedback from parents of these participants through regular surveys and that also helped us constantly evaluate and get better with each session. Early on, there was definitely a moment of panic when we thought we had been hacked. And that is something that scared a lot of people and organizations who ran online classes. 
We later discovered it was only one of our young participants who had discovered the whiteboard feature and interrupted our class. We were fortunate enough to have had some amazing and patient facilitators ready to adapt and explore these new things. As I mentioned, our after school art classes were more visual arts and crafts focused. However, we also run classes on Saturdays that focus on dance, movement, improv theater, intro to acting, spoken word for kids, as well as adults and all ages. We tried bringing in classes that would need many, that would not need many supplies. However, teaching acting classes and imagine teaching theater classes online for the first time was real challenge. We had small groups of these classes so the facilitators could have enough time with each participant on screen and facilitators, they were amazing. They designed some activities which required participants to collaborate and work in groups of two or three, which made it easier for them to break the ice in breakout rooms and open up. Um, ask questions, feel comfortable to perform and practice online. As I mentioned before, getting supplies for each visual arts craft class was a challenge. Although we tried having them with minimal supplies or those with readily available at home, with growing online programs, especially for kids, some of our community members expressed that their kids needed art materials, but the families were not comfortable leaving their homes. With our in-person programming, we always offered free art supplies and snacks, which changed with moving online. And we took the lead again from our community and made a plan to deliver care packages with art supplies to families in our community. We gathered art materials, um, got some donations, figured out logistics with the help of some amazing leaders within the community who also helped us with spreading the word. We had online signups for families who registered to receive a care package at their doorstep. And this all resonated with our staff and all of us stepped up for deliveries and organized pickup from several locations across Etobicoke. This would not have been possible without the generous donations that came in from the community to buy art supplies and essential materials needed for online classes. And with that, I'll um, let Ian continue. Thank you. <clears throat> So, uh, as, as Akshata mentioned, the uh, Crafting in Quarantine video series was initiated by our seniors art class facilitator, Marianne Verstappen. She was concerned that the seniors would feel isolated without being able to gather for their weekly art classes at Cloverdale Mall. So she came up with several arts and crafts activities that they could do at home using only materials that you would find lying around your house so that they wouldn't have to go out and buy new supplies. Marianne showed us how to make soap carvings, how to make your own watercolor paints, out of uh, corn syrup and food coloring, uh, and how to repurpose all those plastic bags that you have stuffed under your sink, and, and much more. We wanted to make this as easy as possible, so we uploaded the videos to YouTube. Um, in this way, the, the seniors wouldn't have to learn a new technology and could take the classes at their own pace. We put these videos out every Thursday at 11 a.m., just like our in-person classes would have been, to give the group a sense of consistency. Um, we, we also followed up by, by phoning our regular program participants to ask them how they were doing and uh, how they were enjoying the classes. They were very happy to have someone to speak with and we're very appreciative to be able to continue making art with Marianne each week. <clears throat> uh, in March of 2020, when everything changed suddenly, um, studios were closed, programs stopped. Um, so our goal was to design a program that would support local artists. We heard from our artist community about their makeshift studio spaces uh, in their garages, bedrooms, kitchens, and basements. So we decided on to provide a platform to all these wonderful artists to showcase their art, their makeshift home studios, and to promote and sell their work. So we created the Artist Studio Tours program. This program ran on Arts Etobicoke's Instagram twice a week, uh, twice a week initially, and then moving to once a week for almost a year and a half. Through this program, it gave our audiences a sense of connection with local artists and the broader community along with sharing how everyone was adapting to working from home. This also helped us helped our social media interaction and bring in new content and new artists each week. Some artists were very comfortable with the technology and using Instagram as a platform. However, some needed a little bit of extra assistance. So Akshita and I would make sure to meet with them prior to their live studio tour and help those artists out by going over the app's features and doing a little practice run with them. Uh, the next program we'd like to talk about is Spotlight Etobicoke. So, so once we had managed to transition uh, our in-person after school and senior classes online, 
we, we started to look into what new programs we could offer that we wouldn't uh, have been able to do in our normal gallery space. We were aware that some musicians had, had started live streaming performances from their homes, and we thought that this might be an opportunity to try to present some more performing arts. Live performances had been an express community need, and we had some success running a pilot project for musical performances in our uh, satellite space at Cloverdale Mall with musicians from Tafo Music. When this program was put on hold, we looked for a solution online to give the community what they had been asking for. We came across a video streaming platform called Stage 10 that allows one central user to coordinate multiple streams and broadcast them live to a Facebook page. We hired Jason Dole, a, a tech expert who had previously facilitated an electronic music program with us to, to manage the broadcast. We then put out a call for performers to send us audition videos. Performers were required to have a, a camera, a stable internet connection, and were only to perform with other individuals who lived in the same household as them. We received submissions from all kinds of different performers from all across Etobicoke, which, which helped to grow our network of artists. We held a dress rehearsal where Jason could troubleshoot any technical issues with the performers and could coach them on their performance. The dress rehearsal presented an opportunity for Jason to do some one-on-one -on -one mentoring for some of the younger or less experienced performers and teach them how to optimize their setup for live performances, teaching them valuable skills that they could take with them for future performances. On the night of the performance, our communications and development manager, Heather Irvin, hosted the event with Jason coordinating each performer's video feed. We had staff monitoring the chat and asking the audience questions like, what is a song or artist that has helped get you through the lockdown? Just to find out a little bit more about our audience and their interests. There were, there were a couple of minor hiccups with the tech, um, but those actually helped to make the, the experience feel more real and more live. People were commenting in the chat like, wow, it actually is live. The, the Stage 10 platform also has a, a virtual waiting room uh, that acts kind of like a, like a virtual backstage area um, for, for the performers. The artists were, were really active in the chat, um, offering support and hyping each other up before the performances. A few of them even made plans to collaborate with each other in the future. Um, and now we get to move on to our Jerry Dart show, so I'll let Aksha take over for that. Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> so moving on to our gallery space, which was closed like most other places in the city, we still managed to have two juried art shows during the pandemic. And for both the shows, we were able to have an actual physical installation in the gallery space. We were fortunate enough that the artists were willing to drop off their artwork and also to have staff support with the installation and making use of the time. I believe we were just lucky with this. Uh, you know, we just made use of the time that we were allowed to gather in small numbers indoors to install and make all this work. We realized that the least we could do is to have an exhibition and give awards, which we normally do with our juried art shows, uh, which again, the artists were really worried um, that they're going to miss a year doing nothing or having nothing on their CV, you know, doing no shows. So the online version was possible thanks to our website developer, Surface Impressions, who created amazing 3D gallery model and an interactive feature that we call Be the Curator, where anyone could browse 200 plus submissions that we get each year and select their favorite favorites to curate their own custom exhibition and share it with others. It was real quick um, click and drag option on our website that let them curate the show with asking just few questions of what they would like to use a title as, or uh, you know, if they would like to put a little description to the show and we would just publish it for everyone to see it on our website. The second iteration of the Jury Dot show um, in 2021 was very similar to the first one. But this time, we felt more confident with our online staff, and we also added an, uh, added an online reception. We did this on Zoom and invited all the amazing artists, their friends, and family to join us. Since we had the show installed in our gallery, I went into the space physically, and with another device, I could just you know, uh, zoom in and out of the works installed, showing some neat details that um, everyone would want to see. We had the jurors present and they did amazing remarks, um, had time you know, communicating with the artists. Um, and it was a great opportunity for artists to gather and to connect, uh, meet with these experts, curators, uh, jurors, and their peers. 
in normal times, this would have happened in our gallery space uh, with, with definitely some wine and cheese, <laughs> which we missed big time, but we wanted to bring the same experience on this online event. And with that, um, I think we are moving to our learnings and key takeaways and I'll pass it on to you, Ian. Yeah, thank you. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a sort of an overview of the different programs that we uh, had implemented. Um, so uh, among our, the learnings and key takeaways that we, that we came across this past year, uh, I think I'd like to start with the, uh, the, the value of experimentation. So the, the new normal had presented us with an opportunity to experiment and take risks while trying new things. Since no one knew what was going on and everyone was just sort of trying to figure out uh, things as they went, we had the freedom to play with new ideas that we might not try in a normal year. We asked ourselves, what can we do online that wasn't possible before? We were always looking for ways to incorporate more performing arts into our programming. And with the move to digital, we saw an opportunity to make that happen. Our, our storefront gallery space is well suited for displaying art and for hosting classes, but it's not ideal for performances because it's quite small and the acoustics are not very good. Uh, as we were migrating our programs online, we realized that our physical space was no longer a limitation for us. We now have the freedom to try to explore the possibility of hosting live performances like Spotlight Etobicoke, which featured performers from across Etobicoke and was live streamed directly to our audience's homes. We could also run acting classes now, which had been a frequent request from our community. Since everyone was using video chat, the participants could also get on camera experience. This also allowed the facilitator to go back through the recordings with the students and analyze their performances more thoughtfully. We were also able to reach new geographic areas, especially in North Etobicoke, where the lack of accessible transit and community spaces had previously made programming challenging. We could test out different approaches to our programming, and if they didn't work out as intended, then we would try to dig in and figure out why it wasn't working. Was our audience having difficulty learning to use the new platform? Was our outreach strategy somehow missing our target audience? Was it just not the right time to be doing this particular program? Last summer, we were trying to get people to sign up for a series of art classes in the Kingsview Village, the Westway community, which has a large Muslim population. We were trying to figure out why we weren't getting as many signups until some members of the community pointed out to us that part of the program is actually overlapping with Ramadan. And if we just shifted the workshops by a week, then more people could participate. So we took the community's feedback and adjusted our timelines and who had much better engagement and the classes filled up almost immediately. When our experiments proved successful, then we could re reiterate them and introduce new elements to try to keep things feeling fresh, fresh and exciting, such as the Zoom opening reception uh, we held for a second juried art show online. In this way, we learned as much from our success as our mistakes. Throughout our experiments, we tried to gather as much data as possible to help inform our programming and outreach efforts. A big advantage of using digital programs, digital platforms, is that it, it makes it much easier to track stats like registration, viewers over time, and audience retention. And tracking data can be built into just about any program you're already running. You can learn a lot by doing a follow-up survey with program participants and asking them what they liked or didn't like about the program and how it could be improved. Whether or not they would recommend the program to a friend can help you plan your outreach strategy and find out who to contact when promoting future iterations of your program. Right, and with that, um, our second um, essential or the important uh, key learning was teamwork. This has been an important pillar of our collective success at Arts Etobicoke. So back when our staff were all working together at the office, we would hold weekly, uh, a weekly staff meeting every Tuesday to give each other updates on what we were working on and how different projects were progressing. When we began working remotely, we opted to continue our staff meetings and start holding short meetings every morning to help us stay on top of things. Meeting regularly helped us to make sure that projects continue to run smoothly, even though we were not able to see each other or if we were not in the same space. It was surprising to see how smooth this transition was and all of us on our team feel very confident about each other and we know that we will get the support we need and feel comfortable to ask for it without hesitation. Our executive director, Wendy Redding, encourages each one of us to explore, experiment, and empowers us to develop and advance. We are also fortunate to have a supportive board of directors to trust us on leading projects that speak to the needs of the community. Our team doesn't shy away from saying yes to trying new things and learning from mistakes. This is strongly driven down through Wendy's leadership style to all of us on the team. 
I know that if I need support or I'm feeling swamped, I can count on my team to step in and help out. This year has been exhausting, emotionally, physically, and in every way for all of us, and the leadership recognizes this. Some people are surprised to hear that we still have daily staff meetings, but we have found that keeping a consistent line of communication has helped us to work more effectively as a team. We can troubleshoot problems with the whole team, share roadblocks we are experiencing, and brainstorm solutions as a team real time. Aside from just helping us to stay on top of projects and tasks, having a daily check-in is nice to just be able to chat with our colleagues and keep our spirits up. We have all been missing out on human interaction this year. And I think we have, we have come to appreciate how important it is to connect with others, even if it's just to talk about, you know, the television shows we've been watching or a new pizza place we've tried. While it may seem excessive to meet every day, it has helped us keep us accountable and on top of tasks to keep our programs running smoothly and on time. And believe me, this has helped us keep us going since last March without missing a single week of programming. Our third key essential contributor to our success has been our community partners, without whom we would have not been able to achieve all of our programming goals. We constantly work towards gathering data from our programs through surveys, interviews, and informal feedback from participants. All of this has helped us understand our community and we are getting better at it and learning about them through our programs each, each day, I would say. We are integrating these data collection methods to all of our programs, which help us to keep informed about our community needs, rather growing and changing community needs. The cross-sectoral partnerships have also helped us to get the pulse of the community involved. Several A Arts Etobicoke staff regularly attend the roundtables and meetings held by various Etobicoke community groups and clusters. And programming in partnership with public schools, libraries, health and community centers, newcomer groups, and many more. Especially reaching outside of the arts, arts sector has helped us to promote our online workshops and programs. The health services organizations are talking to community every day. They are the frontline services and know what the community needs. They know who's struggling and they have the community's trust. Making connections and building relationships with these organizations and asking what they need and how we can support them is very important and is a key to reaching out to a much broader and diverse community. Remember that we don't want to overburden these health centers. We are asking how we can support them as an arts organization and bringing them fully formed programs that required no additional effort on their part. Sometimes we also pay them for their time and we just hope that every organization is able to adapt to this model at some point. Our another key learning has been the challenges that came with digital outreach. We agree that outreach is very different online and before the pandemic, we used to do a lot of grassroots outreach, relying on handing out flyers at the community events and making in-person connections. Our community members were used to seeing us in person. And while we have always had a digital presence through our newsletter and social media, our audience was not as used to engaging us in the same way. With digital communications, it is important to consider the marketing rule of three as we know. People often need to hear about something three times before it really sticks with them. Through some trial and error, we learn to condense our communications, keeping them short and simple and have multiple touch points for the community to find out about our programming. We hired people from the community, uh, such as community cultural leaders and story coordinators who also regularly called past participants, pro community members and artists for their feedback, and short or long interviews. This is helping us find the right places we want to reach out to and how we could reach out to our community in multiple ways and build connections to promote our existing and upcoming workshops. We also need to address the new digital barriers through efforts like lending laptops and training audiences to have the technical skills they need to adapt. Now that we have explain to you how we have made some of our decisions and learnings that we've had. 
uh, giving you an overview of all our programs, not all, but most, most of them, and shared some of our key learnings, we would like to give you some tips and tricks to help you develop your own programming. And with that, I'll um, ask Ian to continue. Thank you. Uh, so, so the first, um, uh, first tip that I'd like to share with you uh, is the importance of considering your audience and how they're going to interact with the, your chosen platform. Um, so it's, it's really important that the participants can ask the facilitator, so excuse me. <clears throat> so, so when thinking about your chosen platform, uh, is it important that the participants can ask the facilitator questions and get feedback in real time? Um, or should the facilitator be able to see everybody on screen and, and, get a, and be able to see their artwork? Uh, should the facilitator, uh, does the platform require the user to spend a lot of time learning the, a new interface and, or can anyone pick it up with minimal effort? Um, while, while young people are highly adaptable and tend to pick up new technology very quickly, um, seniors may struggle when learning to use a new platform and might benefit from a little bit more coaching to get them familiar and feeling comfortable with the format. Do not take people's digital literacy for granted. And it's a good idea to have a plan to support those who require a little extra assistance. Uh, this could look like having a, a member of staff who is available to troubleshoot technical problems over the phone. It could also include sharing a written step-by-step -step guide on how to download, log in, and get started using your chosen platform. We also found it helpful for uh, Zoom calls to, to start the call 15 minutes early and um, to, to, to open it up 15 minutes early to provide a, a live in-person walkthrough of how to use the platform and answer questions um, and, and answer any questions as they come up. <clears throat> um, answer any questions as they come up uh, so they understand what is expected of them at that time. Um, uh, another good idea is to try to keep the program contained within one platform as much as possible. Don't send them off to another outside link as this can just be confusing for participants as they could get lost in the shuffle. Just like how your website should let users find what they're looking for with as few clicks as possible, you want to avoid moving your program from one platform to another or you risk your audience getting confused or frustrated. It's also important to have a backup plan in case something goes wrong, like a participant getting disconnected and being unable to get back in. In this case, you could provide a transcript of the workshop or keep a recording so they don't completely miss out on the experience. Just, just, just remember to, to notify participants that they're being recorded and get their permission beforehand. Another thing to consider by your audience is that when you're offering free programs, uh, sometimes folks will register for a free program or class uh, and not show up because they got distracted or they simply forgot. Online audiences tend to be a bit flakier because it's less of a commitment to turn on your computer and drop into a class than to actually go to one in person. Don't be discouraged if some people don't show up to your program. It's not that your program isn't great. Digital fatigue is very common and constant video calls can be really exhausting. We will So what we do is we will often over-register our programs because we know that some people just won't show up. Um, so if, we, if we're aiming for a uh, so if we want 10 people to show up, we might aim for 20 registrations. Uh, it'll also help if you send out a reminder email to participants before class or, or even calling them on the phone. Just as with gauging your audience's comfort level with technology, it's important to ask your artists what they're most comfortable with and what platform is best suited to their teaching style. Be sure to set aside some time to practice with them so that they feel confident managing the space themselves. Uh, when we book our, studio, our artist studio tours, uh, on Instagram Live, we offer to do a practice run through with them to make sure that they're familiar with the platform. Not everyone takes us up on this, but some artists, it, it helps to practice uh, navigating the app, especially if they've never done a live before. We have an alternate, uh, inst we have a, like an alternate Instagram account that is private and the only followers are Arts Etobicoke staff, um, where, we can where we can provide some basic training uh, on how to do an artist talk on Instagram Live and provide feedback on their presentation. We, we try to build in some kind of training or professional development for artists whenever possible, even if it's something just as simple as using Instagram. <clears throat> when registering participants for online programs, it's a good idea to ask them if you can provide any accommodations to make them more comfortable beforehand. While online programs allow you to reach a wider audience and in many ways improve accessibility, at the same time, they can present new challenges for some individuals. 
So ask participants if there's anything you can do to make their experience with the platform more comfortable. Uh, for instance, one thing we found is that some folks get really bad migraines on a video call. This is especially true for neuro neurodivergent people with a sensitivity to light. Uh, so things like an animated zoom background or flickering lights or a spinning ceiling fan can be very aggravating. And it's just a, a good idea to try to avoid these things. You might find that it's actually not within your organization's capacity to meet all the needs of your audience, but it's important to ask so that you understand your audience better and can make adjustments in the future. You might not be able to hire an ASL interpreter, but maybe you could include captions on your videos or provide a transcript that they can follow along with. There, there are a number of apps that will auto-generate captions on Zoom, such as Verbit, Rev, or Otter AI. Uh, some, of these, some of these can be a bit uh, expensive, um, but most will let you do a free trial to see if it's the right fit for your organization. I'm just gonna take some water quickly. I'm sure we've all experienced technical difficulties. Technical difficulties are always going to happen. So that's why it's a good idea to have a backup plan for dealing with internet issues. Uh, otherwise you dismiss voices. Have a member on staff, of staff on hand who can troubleshoot and offer technical assistance should anyone encounter difficulty signing in and provide participants with a phone number that they can call for support. Also, it's a good idea to have an offline chat just for your staff to communicate with one another outside of the Zoom call. Depending on the scale of the program, you will likely want at least two staff members present to moderate the program. If you're on Zoom, you can have a staff member co-host the Zoom session along with a facilitator. Uh, this staff member can oversee things like admitting participants as they arrive, spotlighting the speaker, uh, managing any breakout rooms you might have, and moderating the chat. Uh, in this way, the facilitator can focus on just teaching and doesn't need to worry about managing the digital space. It, it's even better if you can have someone who is solely responsible for moderating the chat function. The chat feature is really useful for, for participants to get their questions out there as they think of them without interrupting the flow of the presentation. Then the chat moderator can pose those questions to the facilitator when it's more appropriate. You can also have someone moderating on Instagram Live. Um, so, so viewers can request to join a live and then the host hits accept and they will uh, appear on a split screen with the host, like, like we've got here in this slide. <clears throat> This can be very useful for interactive programs where the presenter and the audience are having a conversation with one another. We've also found it helpful with some of our studio tour artists who were a little bit nervous um, just to be talking by themselves. So Akshita or myself could jump onto the live with the artist and ask a few icebreaker questions or, or read off the audience's questions as they are coming in to help direct their presentation. Uh, most recently, we did a digital performance series for Pride Month featuring poetry and drag performances they were uh, hosted by the amazing poet, Tanya Neumeyer. So Tanya was acting as, a, as an MC for the performance series, welcoming the audience and introducing a different guest performer each week. And then uh, after each performance, Tanya would come back and have a little conversation with the performer uh, based on questions and comments that had come up in the chat. This is just one example of how you can use Instagram Live to host performances or, or even classes with two artists who are in different spaces. Another thing to keep in mind uh, with the chat feature on both Zoom and Instagram Live is that people won't be able to see chat messages uh, from before they entered the call. So if you have really important information that you want everyone to be able to see, you should repost that information a few times so that nobody misses it. Uh, on Instagram Live, you're also able to pin one comment that will remain visible uh, at the bottom of the screen for the duration of the live. <clears throat> Uh, most of the, the programs that we have talked about today were developed either in collaboration with community members or were a response to an express need from the community. When it comes to designing your programs for online audiences, we have found that if you're trying to run a program that the community has not asked for specifically, people will be reluctant to try it online. When we were running our in-person arts in the park programs, people were more willing to explore new things. They, they might see a, a group of people dancing in the park and feel inspired to drop in and join the group on an impulse. Whereas if they just saw Capoeira dance class advertised online, they might think, I don't know what that is and just keep scrolling. This is why it's so important to listen to what the community is asking for and determine where, and determine where you can meet their needs so that you're not just guessing what they want and programming in the dark. The, the final thought that we would like to share with you is the importance of developing a relationship with your artist facilitators that's based on mutual trust. 
They need to know that you have their back and will support them and provide them with the resources to make them feel comfortable and confident teaching on a digital platform. When we hire an artist to facilitate a program, we are looking at what their artistic skills can bring to the community. We're not looking for digital experts. We can teach them the ins and outs of digital platforms. We are looking for their artistic expertise and figuring out how we can best support them in facilitating our programming, as well as how we can support their own professional development beyond the program. In this way, we build lasting relationships with artists who are excited to come back and work with us. So before we, we move on to questions, I think Akshita had uh, another little online engagement for us. Uh, yes, I do have a set of questions again uh, to ask, just to learn about all of you here. Um, so my first question is, would you rather take a class in acrylic painting or watercolor painting? And you can again answer by just raising your hands or in the chat box, however you like. Great, we have tens of response coming in. Thank you so much. And our uh, second question is, would you rather attend an improv class or a class in puppetry? Puppetry. Great. Oh, yeah, lots of puppets, <laughs> of course. And the last question is, would you rather take a class on Afrobeats or hip hop? That would be a tough one. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you so much. This so much was enjoyed. great and thank you so much for listening us so patiently and we are happy to answer. I know there are some amazing questions that have already come through, so I'll pass it on to Elisa. Yes, thank you so much, Ian and Akshata. That was fantastic. And I think one thing that's so helpful is just the amount of examples that you provided. So many of these programs are favorites for our Culture Days organizers, the studio tours and kind of getting that at home look is a really interesting twist necessary this year, but a really interesting twist in a way that maybe our organizers could do it as well. Uh, I'm just going to pull up. We got quite a few questions, so let me just pull up our first one here. Um, the first one asks, um, is Arts Etobicoke considering continuing any of these types of programs, even when regular in-person programs can take place safely? Uh, do you see the potential for expanding these permanently? Yeah, um, yeah, I think we, we are having these conversations almost, um, you know, a, a, a lot these days uh, with reopening. Uh, but I think we are looking at a hybrid model. And yeah, there's definitely having both that this, that there's lots of um, benefits of having online programs, because that is what we've come across the silver lining in all this problematic time that we have faced. Um, that people with accessibility concerns and you know people um, who cannot come all the way to our office space and as we mentioned our office space is small and um, space is a constraint it's not any longer with online models so yeah I think we are looking at a hybrid model and continuing some of our programs. Fantastic and then another question again about the digital programs and the reach it said did your digital program presentation attract and engage participants beyond etobicoke and if so how far was the impact if that was measurable yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, our website developer surface impression um they we what we do is uh, with a lot of our programs we we ask a survey at the end and uh, one of the questions we always ask is uh, to enter your postal code so um, our developers have uh, have uh, set up like a, a map that we can track where postal codes are coming from. And yeah, we've, we found that our reach goes well beyond Etobicoke, what, like well into um, uh, like North York and, and uh, Scarborough, also in Mississauga and Brampton, um, and, and a couple from, uh, from Saskatchewan and BC. So yeah. We have also had a Saturday class participant joining us all the way from States. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, and for, for one of our, uh, our artist studio tours, um, they had a lot of family from Iran. So we had people from Iran who were tuning in at, I don't know what time of night it would have been, but it, it would be two, two o'clock in Toronto. But yeah, they were, they, were, they were tuning in super engaged. That's fantastic. Uh, a similar question to that for artists, teachers, or instructors that you hire or use for these programs, 
are they all from Etobicoke or would someone, someone might be interested um, outside of the region in Niagara was asking, do you attract other um, artists from other regions to help with your programs? I would say we usually prioritize uh, facilitators from Etobicoke, but we, we definitely do work with with uh, with folks from all over. Yeah, we always ask for um, some connection to Etobicoke. You know, um, I live in Etobicoke, but I live here only for four years now. But someone may have gone to a school in Etobicoke, but doesn't live in Etobicoke any longer. So we just ask for a broader connection to Etobicoke, um, and that, that's that's good enough for us to have them on. Perfect. And then a question from Kurt in Winnipeg. Um, he says like, big ups, bravo, Arts Etobicoke for everything that you're doing. And for the artist studio tours and the live performances, did you set up a formal agreement with artists about who owns the content afterwards, royalties or remuneration for online purchases? Just wondering if there's a general understanding or if you had a formal agreement beforehand um, and if you could talk about how that worked. Yeah, so, um... Yeah, we, we have been thinking of a lot of um, copyright stuff and, you know, the online rights stuff and the royalties. Uh, but to be honest, we, we, uh, we are a small organization. We are not, uh, you know, we do not have an extensive budget at this point, but we made sure that all of our, our artists were paid. Um, and we did have a letter of agreement with most of our artists, uh, most of our programs. Um, in fact, all of our programs, that's a... Uh, that's a basic uh, good case practice that we follow uh, to have a letter of agreement, uh, have basic expectations mentioned in that, like, you know, artist fees, uh, time commitments and things like that. So uh, yes to some of that, but it, I also feel it's a broader sectoral conversation that needs to happen uh, with things moving online and things being hybrid to some extent in the future uh, and how we see that. I don't know if I fully answered that question, but yeah, we do brainstorm and think a lot on that. I don't know, Ian, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you covered, yeah. No, that's a great answer and definitely part of a larger conversation as well. Uh, the next question, and you did touch on how much you do go to the community and kind of meet them where they're at to, to decide what kind of programming um, you want to be running, what kind of meets the needs there but what has been the most effective way of reaching your community for promotion and outreach to invite people to participate in your activities and classes? Um, I think we've, we've had a lot of success uh, with our community cultural leaders that we hired. Um, they sort of have their finger on the pulse of what, what's going on in the community. We, we rely on them a lot uh, to, do, to do outreach and to be, to be speaking um, with the community every day. Um, and as we, we did mention, um, we, we've got good relationships with, uh, with health organizations, uh, such as uh, the Rexdale Women's Center, um, because, because again, they are also meeting with, with these communities every day and they, they know exactly what they need and, um, and like, yeah, who's, who's, who's struggling and who's, um, what, what, their, what their interests are and that, that sort of thing, yeah. And then this one might be a tough question because there were really great examples across the board, but um, someone from Milton asked, what three activities or events do you feel were the most, most successful? Uh, what was the format and why do you think they performed so well or you had such great engagements? I think the artist studio tours maybe, mm -hmm. because yeah, we, we did like, I don't know how many, we were doing them for a year and a half so yeah lots um and um and they always got really great engagement uh, lots of really great um people really active in the chat and um and then even after uh the live performance or the, the live tour um we would get like loads and loads and loads of views on our, on our instagram and youtube pages when we uploaded them um did you ask for top three um, I would also put in Spotlight Etobicoke for yeah. that because, um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of visual arts based stuff and um, moving on from visual arts and doing something in other areas has always been of a great interest to us, but it just happens that, you know, we have a smaller office space or a gallery space, so we cannot work out performance stuff in our space, but with this going online, um, it just made it possible. It was like a dream come true, you know? Uh, 
uh, having amazing, brilliant performers online live performing and uh, receiving like, uh, yeah, I think we did receive a great response in terms of numbers. I think Ian would have some more details on that, but Spotlight Etobicoke was one of the very successful programs we've had. Fantastic. Yeah, and then we had a, a comment just about how a lot of the examples, I mean, even though you're operating as a small team, these are really helpful for small organizations or groups, but I think there's a way that a lot of these tips and tricks and lessons could be scaled down if you were a, were a single or working by yourself artist or organizer. Do you think that to be true? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, um, yeah. Um taking my art Tobiko hat off and putting the artist hat on. Um, I, yeah, I'm a visual artist, practicing visual artist myself. And I did kind of dabble into multiple uh, stuff during pandemic, you know, uh, exploring virtual reality or augmented reality. And this again helps, like my day job really helps me and pushes me to go and pursue and do the research I need to, because we are doing some amazing a year of public art projects and augmented reality in the village of Islington is one that we've been working on for a year now. It's it's almost launching next next month. It's coming out there. So stay tuned and watch out for our social media space and um, website um, for more information. Um, but yes, I think yeah, even as a as an individual artist, um, just experimenting and trying to do new stuff without you know. Um, being scared of mistakes or failures is, is the key. I think you'll be fine. Just keep, keep hanging there and do stuff. Definitely. And our last question we have time for, um, just for people who are following along with what, what's up next for Arts Etobicoke, someone asked if you'll be increasing outdoor activities this coming summer um, and can participants participate in person as well as virtually, or I don't know what you can share with us about what's coming up, but we've got a few questions about that. Yeah, so, so actually I just touched on it. We're, we're about to launch our, our uh, augmented reality in the Village of Islington project. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've been to the Village of Islington, there's lots of uh, beautiful murals by an artist, John Kuna. Um, and uh, so, so they, they, don't, uh, they don't necessarily reflect the, uh, the demographics that live there now. Um, so what we wanted to do was introduce some new, some more uh, Indigenous stories and some stories from newcomer Canadians. Um, so we've worked with a, a, a team of team of artists and uh, and developers to um, to overlay a new narrative on these, so you, you can interact with on your phone um, the, uh, via augmented reality. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, you, if, if you if you're uh, in the neighborhood, you can explore the village of Islington um, and check out. Uh, we've got our, uh, these uh, stickers that say "Artists Here," and you can scan your phone, download the app. Um, and experience these really cool uh, augmented reality uh, animations and activations. Yeah, and with other programs, I think we we did do park party last year, like park activation. So we did have a series of workshops we ran in in person in park, like outdoor when uh, we could gather in small numbers. I, I believe it was 10 max. So we kind of um, brought in like seven to eight people in to do those activities. And they were all diverse crafts and music and dance and whatnot. And even this year, as we, I think today, since, to, yeah, from today, right? We, we are allowed to gather 25 people outdoors. So yeah, next week is when we begin our once a week outdoor program in uh, two of our neighborhoods in Etobicoke, Capri Road and uh, Kingsway, Kingsview and Westway. So um, yes, uh, fingers crossed, we don't know what that, uh, you know, it's going to look like yet, but yeah, going in there with a lot of excitement and fun programs. Oh, well, no, that's fantastic. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. It's so helpful to hear from our peers in the sector, especially when you're doing stellar work and you're willing to share it with our network. We're very grateful. Um, oh, thank every you so much for having us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, to everyone who joined us today, thank you as well. Um, we'd mentioned before, but just in case, uh, a recording of this webinar is going to be available on the Culture Days website shortly, uh, closed caption. If you um, did want to watch it again, or maybe check out something you want to learn a little bit extra about, and we'll follow up with a message once it's live and ready for viewing. Uh, I want to also point out and remind everyone that we do have quite a few free resources available on the Culture Day site that are linked specifically to digital and online programming 
including a couple previous webinars, tip sheets, and programming inspiration lists. Um, I dropped a few links in the, to those resources in the chat box below, just so if you wanted to check them out. Um, otherwise, don't forget that the best way to stay in the loop with Culture Days news uh, with, you know, things about upcoming webinars and updates and opportunities is through our newsletter. You can sign up at culturedays.ca slash newsletter. And thank you again to our panelists for joining us today and for everyone joining us um, at home. Take care and be well. Thank you. Thank you.